Church of Christ. Uh, he brings with him his lovely wife Amanda and his two boys, Cohen and Mostyn. I didn't. I was trying not to mispronounce it. I hope I got it right. Um, Chad has spent most of his ministry, as we know, working, uh, doing ministry over in the Philippines and in Kenya. Uh, he tells me he's suspending his travel for now, uh, but I'm sure uh, the time will come when he'll be back uh, doing that international work as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to tell you about him, in addition to him being very dynamic, he and Amanda are just really hard workers, and we're so proud of the work that they've done at Indian Land. Uh, they started with about 65 people in 2020. And as, of course, we've gone through the, uh, the turmoil and the pandemic and all of that, even so, they've managed to double in number. So we, we're just really proud of the work they're doing. And uh, I will pause and sit down and let you uh, get into your lesson, Brother Garrett, if you'd make your way forward. Now, as you do that, um, Dan, can we get just a verse of a song? And while we're singing, we want uh, the young adults and the teenagers to stay in here, high school, if you would, stay in here, and then everyone else, you can go ahead and pass to your classes at this time. Good evening, church. You know, I have a weakness for Jesus. When I look back into the Old Testament, I have a weakness for Jesus because I tend to see Jesus everywhere. And, when, and I look at my favorite Old Testament book, Isaiah, and I'm reading Isaiah, and as I go through it, I'm looking for Jesus. And, and sometimes I think I see the scriptures talking about Jesus, where the scriptures may not even be talking about Jesus because I have a weakness for Jesus. You ever find yourself doing that where you're looking at the Old Testament and you go, hmm, is it talking about Jesus? That's our weakness for Jesus, which I believe is a good thing. Tonight, my assignment, brethren, is to uh, see Christ through the prophet Joel. And that couldn't, I couldn't have asked for a better assignment than to find Jesus in Joel, because that's what I do naturally anyway, is looking for Jesus everywhere. So tonight, brothers and sisters, we can join together in our affinity as we look into Joel and we look for Jesus. We're going to look at a few scriptures, though, uh, before we get into Joel and uh, to get our bearings right for this evening. But I wanted to tell you personally that I'm excited to be here with you. It's been a while, and I am truly excited to be in the midst of this wonderful congregation. I can promise you this, that there is no other American church that gives me more amens than the University Church of Christ. Amen. Uh, there is my first one. And I'm going to be reaching in the air. You might see me doing this as I'm putting them in my pockets. So I can take them back with me to the Church of Christ at Indian Land and, and just listen to them as I'm preaching over there. I don't get near the volume of the amens, but in, in all seriousness, I enjoy being in your midst because you're spirited, but you're also standing for the truth, truth and the spirit. And I fully expect, just as all my other times that I've been here, to leave here encouraged by your contagious energy that I can bring it back 
to the family in South Carolina where I preach at the Church of Christ in Indian Land. And by the way, they do send their greetings to you. They are doing well over there. We have three shepherds there. And I want you to know something. Whenever I sit down with the shepherds there and we talk about things that are coming up and we talk about things like the summer series or maybe when I might be gone and and maybe there might be a need to fill in the pulpit with someone besides a member of our congregation there, I always put two names from this congregation forward, Dean Thompson and Ed DeBerry. I always say, brethren, you got to hear them speak. Now, if you've been paying attention, Dean's been to us twice. So, Ed, you're up next. So you go on and get prepared. Open your Bibles tonight to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. Acts chapter 1, beginning verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven." First, I want you to notice a couple of things from this passage that will set our bearings for the rest of the sermon this evening. First, we see that we will not know the time and the season of the return of our Lord and Savior. We can't say it's going to happen on such a day and such a time. We don't know. Jesus says you won't know. It's not for you to know. That's point number one there that will keep our bearings straight. The second is how he left in the clouds, in the sky. And the angel said, that's the way you'll see him return. Very important concepts. But while you're in Acts, it's only very convenient and expedient that we would turn to Acts chapter 2 before we go to Joel. That'll be our next stop. Acts chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 17 Excuse me, I'm going to start in verse 16 so we can see the word Joel. Acts chapter 2 and verse 16. We know this is the day of Pentecost. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit my spirit and they shall prophesy and I shall show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved amen And so we see that this is a prophecy requoted from the prophet Joel. And this we find in Joel chapter 2, in verse 28 and 29. We find this exact quotation. This is very familiar to us. And most people that you would invite to come speak to you on the subject matter of Joel would spend a great deal of time right here in this prophecy, and I'm sure that you've heard some time spent on this prophecy, which is why I am not going to spend time on this prophecy tonight. Again, following my assignment, I'm looking to identify Jesus in the book of Joel. But when we look in the book of Joel, we won't see the name Jesus. We won't find his name. But as often is the case with our God, with Jesus, in the Old Testament, and even today, while we may not see 
him face to face, or we may, maybe we don't see the name, we see his footprint. We see his fingerprints. But in this case tonight, in three ways, we see his day, his work, and his way in the book of Joel. Let's look about his day in the book of Joel. If you'll turn to Joel, we're going to look in chapter 1. We're going to look at several scriptures together uh, regarding this concept of his day in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 1, and I'm going to begin in verse number 15. Joel chapter 1 and verse 15. The Bible says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. And as destruction from the Almighty it comes, it is not the food, is not the food cut off before your eyes, and joy and gladness from the house of our God. Now look at Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on the holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. Look at Joel chapter 2 verse 11. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? And look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 31. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Look at Joel chapter 3 and verse number 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. There is now five times we find the day of the Lord in the book of Joel with one additional reference which is found in Joel chapter 3 and verse 18. Not specifically the day stated, but certainly referring to the day. Joel chapter 3 verse 18 reads, And in that day the mountain shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water from the valley of Shittim. The day of the Lord is mentioned now, as noted consistently in every chapter in the book of Joel. And in every situation where we read about the day of the Lord, we read words such as judgment, fear, trembling, darkness, and that it is near. With only one exception, and that is in the reference to Joel 3.18, which is symbolic of heaven, which is positive, which is the reward, which is salvation. You know, it's understandable that as Joel, a prophet during his time, he was seeing his nation shaken up. He was seeing agricultural devastation and economic instability. And as he looked at that, he was proclaiming to the people of Israel, the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. You know, sometimes prophets understood some of the message that they were speaking and delivering, but sometimes they were very nearsighted and saw just what was there in front of them, not understanding that, in fact, they were speaking about something in the distant future. But don't we do the same thing? During COVID, when that, when that really took off, my wife and I were in the Philippines, we were in Manila, a city of 14 million people, that's a quarter the size of Charlotte, imagine that. And we were teaching nursing seminars there at a church to bring people in as a recruiting process, as a, you know, as a prospecting process to, to make a relationship with them. And, and the president of the Philippines ordered us to leave, not us by name, but said, if you're not a, a Filipino citizen, get out. And we had to leave in 24 hours. And to see all that mass exodus, people leaving Manila, 
all these millions trying to leave and to go to different places in the Philippines or go back to their country where they were from. I heard people around me, even here in America, say things like, oh, look at this. It's a plague. It's a disease. We're at the end times. Jesus is coming. And he's coming now. You can see it. We're in these troubled times. I remember the day that September 11th happened. I was alarmed to turn on the TV where I saw airplanes flying into the World Trade Center. I wondered, did somebody sabotage the media? This can't really be airplanes, large aircrafts flying into New York, into the World Trade Centers. And then what happened next with them exploding and falling down, we just sat and watched. I heard people say, See, here it is. Here's the times. Here's, there's terrorism. We're at the end times. We're at the end days. This is it. This is, this is those pains that Jesus was talking about. And, and, and you know, if, if you were alive and, 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 and remembering the times of Vietnam, you probably heard some of those same types of things. Man, these are wars and rumors of wars. This is it. And, and, and those people who were alive back in World War II, can you imagine that? This is global war now. They must have been saying the same thing. This is it. This is it. He's coming. He's right. These are the wars. People in every generation, including Joel, when they run into a national economic or agricultural crisis of their country, are quick to say, the day of the Lord is here. It's near. Look at the destruction. Look at the devastation. And while Joel was true as he preached his his prophecy, and he preached to the people that there was destruction and there was every reason to reevaluate their life, he may not have understood that in fact he was also talking about the day that we have not seen yet. It's our scriptures in the New Testament that say it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Brethren, let's make sure then that we don't fall. Let's make sure that on the day of the Lord we kneel in expectation and not fall because of our failure to be obedient to the Lord. The day of the Lord is often referred to as being near, and again, I think this is twofold, and I think it was twofold for, for Joel and, and the prophets who declared it. Peter correctly identified the day of the Lord in Acts chapter 2 as he declared Joel's prophecy. What he was saying was that Jesus came, the day of the Lord, it, it's, it's happened. Joel, Peter was saying that as he gave the time stamp that God proved Jesus by signs and miracles and wonders you killed them, and God raised them. Now, that was a day of the Lord. Jesus came and visited face to face. That was a day. But there was still yet the day that we are all still looking to be completely fulfilled. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse number 2. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. Remember how we started this evening in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, and there were two points that we looked at. The first one being that Jesus said, it is not for us to know the time or the season. Jesus hasn't come back yet, brethren. It's not too late. Jesus hasn't come back yet. He is coming. I don't know when. He's coming. And so Jesus is coming and we look forward to the day of the Lord. The day. The day of the Lord, which is judgment day. It's the day he's coming back out on the clouds to, to come and well redeem his people. But that'll be a day of judgment. It'll be a day of judgment on this earth. Don't forget that it's not too late 
and that Jesus is coming. That's one way we identify Jesus in the book of Joel. Because when we move into the New Testament, and you are New Testament Christians such as I, when we read about the day of the Lord, we know that's talking about Jesus' day. We know that. Well, the day of the Lord is talked about five times in the book of Joel. Clearly identifiable and clearly attached to the eschatological time span that we look forward to now in our dispensation where Jesus is coming and that will be his day. We move on now in the book of Joel to his work. Another way we can identify Christ in the book of Joel. And when you think about Jesus, when I think about Jesus, I think about two big concepts. I think about salvation and sovereignty. That is, I think about Jesus will redeem and Jesus will reap. Jesus will redeem and Jesus will reap. I want to ask you a question. The last book in our Bible is entitled Revelation. Whose revelation is that? Let's look and find out. The Bible gives us the answer in Revelation chapter 1 in the very first verse. Whose revelation is this revelation? I'll wait for you to get there. Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. This is Jesus' revelation, brethren. John wrote it down. He's, this isn't his revelation. He wrote it down so we could understand what Jesus wanted who to know. His servants. That's you. That's me. He wants us to know his revelation. What I find fascinating about Jesus and his work in the book of Joel, especially as we look to the book of Revelation, and because this is Jesus' revelation, in the book of Revelation, Jesus refers to Joel chapter 1 verse 6 in Revelation 9 8. Joel chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 in Revelation 9 7. Joel chapter 2 verse 5 in Revelation 9 9. Joel chapter 2 verse 10 in Revelation 6 12 through 13 and Revelation 8 12. Joel chapter 2 11 in Revelation 5 11. Joel chapter 2 verse 31 in Revelation 6 12. Joel chapter 3 verse 13 in Revelation 14 15 verse 19 and chapter 19 verse 15. Joel chapter 3 verse 15 in Revelation 6 12 through 13, chapter 8 verse 12. And finally, Joel chapter 3, verse 18, and Revelation 22, verse 1. Jesus refers to every chapter in the book of Joel in his revelation. Brethren, that's Christ in the book of Joel. That is a huge connection. That is eye-opening. Jesus referred to the book of Joel for us, his servants, to know about the end times. Are you serious? That is Jesus in the book of Joel. He's pointing us there. That's amazing to me. While I don't have the time allotted to exegete all of those references, I chose one in particular. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 14. Let's look at that together. It's a special, special chapter for us. Revelation chapter 14 in verse number 14. Then I looked and behold a white what? A white what? Remember in Acts chapter 1 verses 6 and the following. There's two points here tonight that we're following. We're not going to know the times and seasons. But when we see Jesus coming back, how is he coming? In the clouds of the sky. And Jesus tells us here, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, praise God, 
and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. This is the quotation now that we find in Joel chapter 3 and verse number 13. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread for the winepress is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great, which puts the context of Revelation into clear view for us. Jesus coming in the clouds will come down as his angels call out, reap, the earth is ready, reap. And when you swing a sickle, you swing it like a golf club, you swing that sickle like that, and it cuts everything in its path. And Jesus is going to come like a farmer would to harvest Everything. And as the farmer comes and harvests everything, he cuts it all down. He cuts the grain down with the weeds. And he separates the grain from the chaff and lets it blow away in the wind. Jesus is coming in the clouds in the sky and he's going to come and he's going to reap every person. He's going to cut them all down. He's going to save those who are saved. And he's going to judge those who are disobedient, ignorant, evil, misinformed. He, is, he will judge them and cast them into hell. That's what the rest of this is talking about. And Jesus points us there and ties it in with Joel and said, I'm coming. I'm going to do this. This is the work of Jesus. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. And when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Jesus is the reaper. And we see that work in the book of Joel. That is Jesus. He is the one reaping. That is the conquering Messiah. This is who... Israel was expecting to come the first time. They were expecting the Messiah to come and reap and to sickle and to cut down all the Romans all around them and to reestablish the temple and the fortress in Jerusalem. And they were expecting a conquering Messiah. But instead what they got, thankfully, what we've received is a saving Messiah, not a reaping Messiah. The day of reaping is the work of Jesus, and I promise you that it's not too late. It's not too late for you, it's not too late for your family, it's not too late for your children, because the second concept that we find in the book of Joel is Jesus' work of redemption. Redemption is certainly the work of Jesus, and thankfully... Redemption comes before reaping. I'm thankful for that. Let's look at Joel chapter 2 together. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 through 13. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 through 13. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. I can't help but hear the words of Jesus when He spoke. When He said, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when He said, This people honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. In Matthew chapter 15 and verses 6 through 9. Jesus calls for our hearts, not our garments. He calls for personal commitment and personal obedience. Consequently, when Christ came to the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for Me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do Your will, O God, as it is written of Me in the scroll of the book, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. God says to rend your hearts. You know what that means? It means to split open. Split open up. Split open up. It sounds painful. Split open your hearts. To who? Not to each other, but to God. Open your hearts to God. That's what He's calling for. I can button up. I can look fancy, I can look like a preacher, I can put on the right tie and the right suit and wear the right shoes and do all that looks like what a preacher is supposed to look like, I guess. That's not what God's calling me to do. God's not calling me to look like a preacher. He's calling me to get on my knees and to open up my heart and to talk to Him. He's asking me, to, He's telling me, not asking, He's saying, Chad, you need to split open your heart and you need to talk to me about what's going good in your life and let's talk about the blessings. Let's celebrate that together. He's also telling me, Chad, you need to open up your heart and tell me what you're sinning, struggling and sinning with. What do you keep doing? What's got you? How's the devil taking you down the wrong roads? Talk to me, Chad. Ring your heart open. Come back to me. Forget about what you look like. I want to know what's going on in your spirit, Chad. Talk to me. That's what God's calling us to do in the book of Joel. And there is nobody who talks like that better than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who was on the cross and said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is Jesus talking in the book of Joel. This is something that we need to take seriously and I believe is the heart of the message in Joel is to rend our hearts and to give our hearts back to God even in the face of disaster. Yet we find in the book of Joel chapter 2 verse 32 what I call a Jesus statement. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32 A Jesus statement. We find this. Oh, we find this. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus is saying that everyone who does this, there's not going to be anybody who's just not good enough. Everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You won't have to worry about if you, well, I don't know if I'm strong enough. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I'm tall enough. No, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a Jesus statement. Acts 22 and verse 16 says, And why do you wait, rise and be baptized, wash your way, your sins calling on His name? That is a Jesus statement. Jesus is coming, friends, visitors, brothers, sisters. And Jesus' work is redemption right now. It's not too late. It is not too late to rend your hearts to Jesus. It's not too late. This is the time of redemption right now. But when the time of reaping comes, it's too late. It's too late. But Jesus is coming, brethren. Jesus is coming. Don't play chicken. Don't ride the fence. Jesus' redemption is now. Which brings me to my third point tonight. His way. Jesus' way is found in the book of Joel. We find that God wants us to look forward. That's a Jesus concept. How many times, though, do we 
dwell on the past? How many times might we say, hmm, I wonder if this is just who I am then because of what I did 15 years ago, five years ago, five days ago. How often do we get stuck in the past and we think that that somehow defines us or we might think, I don't know if the church is going to fellowship with me or what might the church think of me because of my past. But Jesus doesn't call us to look at the past. He calls us to look forward. God calls us to look forward. He again corrects this type of thinking when twice in the book of Joel, these things are stated. Joel chapter 1 and verse 14 is the first. Look at that. Joel chapter 1 and verse 14. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Look at the second time this is said in Joel chapter 2. Verses 15 through 16. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. Even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride or chamber. We have got to get back to heartfelt worship, brethren. That's what this is. In the midst of disaster... Jesus said, don't look back and don't even look at the disaster. Get back to worship. Worship God and see what happens. Consecrate a fast. Call together the assembly of the people and get back together and worship God. Jesus said, Joel says this is so important that even a marriage was interrupted. Hey, time out. You come on out here, bride and groom. We've got to worship God right now. It's time to worship. That's the level of importance placed on worshiping God in the midst of a disaster. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That is forward thinking. That's looking forward, not backwards. That's not even looking at the disaster. That's looking past it. And what are we moving forward with Jesus to see? I want you to see this beautiful thing in Joel chapter 3 in verse number 17 and 18. Joel chapter 3 verses 17 and 18. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountain shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and the water, the valley of Shittim. This is a figurative, brethren. And so, I mean, milk isn't going to come from the ground, and you get that. This is figurative of heaven. We're looking forward to worship right now. We come to get, we're worshiping tonight. We're worshiping now. A solemn assembly has been called, and we're worshiping now on the day of Jesus' work of redemption. But we're also looking forward to Jesus in heaven. We're looking forward to be with Jesus. In heaven. <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> bring this back. I want to bring this back to you in context in a way of application. Look at Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1 and verses 1 through 7. I want you to understand what's happened in the, the time frame here with Joel and his people. Joel chapter 1 and verse number 2. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation what the cutting locust left the swarming locust has eaten what the swarming locust left the hopping locust has eaten what the hopping locust left the destroying locust has eaten awake 
O oh, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, and its fangs of lioness. It has laid waste of my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down, and their branches are made white. Now, skip over with me to verse 11. Talking about farmers here. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the fields has perished. The vines dry up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. And all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. What we're looking at at the day and time of Joel, this is now debatable amongst people much smarter than me. But here's the debate. Is it locusts or is it an army? Or is it both? Was it locusts and then an army? Here's what we do know for sure. They had agricultural devastation. They lost food to the point that children had no joy. We've not experienced that. And when you think about your children or your grandchildren or children that you may know, they have so much joy. You ever seen a mama get on to their child, and boy, they get in trouble, and boy, they're crying, and then the next few minutes later, they're just as happy as can be. Children are just full of joy. And to see little children that have no more joy because they're hungry, that's what was happening in their nation. And so now you understand the devastation that they were facing. Now today, not today, but recently, I was online about a year and a half ago, and I saw a comedian get up and he made a joke about, I can't find any toilet paper anymore, and, and went on and people were laughing, and then I saw some comments about the the, the, the comedian, I said, no, this is true. And I, I said, what's true about not having toilet paper? And I went to the store. There was no toilet paper. Somebody was kind enough to leave me one roll of paper towels. That's all that I had left to buy. Do you all remember that? When you went to the store and we couldn't find toilet paper. Now, if you would have gone back before that, before COVID, and said, Chad, a day's coming in America, you're going to go to try to find toilet paper, and there'll be none. I'd say, what? <laughs> what? We're going to be shorted to toilet paper now. You're just pulling my leg. You're telling me a joke. But we were. And then the next, most recently, was baby formula. Now, for us who don't have babies, or, or maybe even specifically those who have babies with specific formula needs, and they can't get formula for the babies? I want you to imagine that for a minute. How stressful, how concerning, how upside down their world is all of a sudden for their little infant that they can't get formula for. This is the type of context that we look at when we look at Joel. And furthermore, when we think about that, we think about our day. I've been hearing lots of voices, lots of different people talking from different avenues that we're running into a, a food shortage, it's coming, and recession is coming, and food shortage, and all these chickens are dying, and all these hogs, and pigs, and cows, and all this, is, and Russia's not going to send us wheat anymore, and all these things. If you watch any news, you've been hearing the same thing, food shortage, food shortage, food shortage. That is what the people of Israel were facing in the book of Joel. But there was one additional thing they were also facing at the same time that's absolutely devastating. I want to show it to you. It's in Joel chapter 3 and verses 2 through 3. It will blow your mind. Joel chapter 3 and verses 2 through 3. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land, and have cast lots for my people, and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. 
In Joel's day, foreign nations were taking Israelites and they were trafficking children. Human trafficking, which we also are well aware of that takes place not only in our country, but even in the state of North Carolina. We understand that. That's what was happening then. That's why your shepherds had such a vision to connect with the book of Joel and Jesus because this is speaking to our day right now. It's happened again. We are in the midst of the book of Joel. So what are we going to do as God's people as we look out and we see, well, we might be in a recession. It might be upon us tomorrow. We might be in a food shortage. might be on us tomorrow. I don't say that to scare you. Here's why I say it. When the locusts come, don't look at the locusts. That's not forward thinking. When the locusts come to cause a recession... When the locusts come to cause baby formula shortages and food shortages, when the locusts come, you look to Jesus. You look to the day of the Lord for it is near. You look for His redeeming work that is happening now and you look for His reaping work that's coming. And finally, you keep thinking like Jesus Not looking backwards, not looking nearsighted, but looking forward to worship every Sunday and every Wednesday, looking to worship God now and looking to be with Jesus in heaven. Brethren, it's not too late. It is not too late, but Jesus is coming. Make no mistake about it. And sitting on the fence is turning your back on Jesus. Don't sit on the fence Don't get caught up, brethren, and getting stressed out about the disasters that we may be facing in our time. Don't do that. Think about Jesus. He's going to get you through this. He's always gotten His people through. And even if He comes back, He's going to get you through this. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And today is an excellent day. A wonderful day during the era of Jesus' redeeming work to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that promise is for you and your children and all who are far off whom the Lord God calls, and He's calling you tonight. Perhaps you need prayers from the church. Tonight's a great time to do that. Won't you come forward as we stand and as we sing? Calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of the wheels are wrong, father and father away.
until the last few days. And from Sister Avis also coming in online, please pray for her grandson, Nicholas, who has COVID. Also, I want to ask for prayers uh, for Nico, who has uh, our grandson, who has a ear infection. Uh, also, um, pray for uh, Dean, who's up at Lake Norman, speaking. That's why he's not here tonight. Uh, so, <clears throat> let's go down and pray this time. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful message tonight uh, from Brother Derek and uh, how he made it plain, giving us this great lesson and then giving us this great application as well. Father, we thank you for him. We pray that you'll continue to bless him, uh, to give him the strength to continue boldly proclaiming your word everywhere that he goes. We pray for his sons and his wife and others that you'll continue to bless their health and keep them safe, dear God. We just thank you for all of the uh, ministers out there working to proclaim the word in this world that needs your word uh, so desperately. Father, we thank you for uh, the, the people that are out tonight. Uh, bless us and keep us safe, dear God. Uh, and, and thank you for giving all of us the spirit uh, and the understanding to know that we need to be together uh, as often as we can. Uh, we pray this especially for Sister Smith and Brother Smith as they travel, going up to see uh, Alex Jr. And, and Father, we just pray for him continually and all of our college students that you'll protect and keep them and guide them, keep them grounded. Dear God, we pray uh, for Sister, Sister Clark, who always looks after all of us and those in the community. Continue to bless her and give her strength. Dear God, we pray for uh, the Sally family who uh, lost their brother. Dear God, we, we know how terrible it is for you to lose a, a loved one. And we pray that that family will be comforted uh, by your word and that, uh, uh, that if, if uh, uh, Sister Hawkins and Hawkins' family can be of assistance, that you'll guide them to be able to do so. Dear God, we pray for our sister Tabitha Taylor, who has a migraine. Father, Father we pray that you'll uh, soothe her, dear God, and bring her back uh, to her full health, dear God, swiftly uh, and completely. Dear God, we pray uh, for Nicholas, the grandson, and uh, uh, Sister Avis, dear God, that you'll bless him to be able to get through this bout with COVID, dear God, and that you'll bless him. Uh, not to have any residue, dear God, and, and lingering uh, effects of that terrible virus, dear God. But we just thank you, dear God, again, and that you'll ask that you'll bless us all. We know that uh, COVID is still uh, popping up here and there, dear God, and we just pray that we'll not get careless. Uh, but we trust in you continually and completely, dear God, and, and uh, we just pray that you'll protect us and keep us, dear God. Uh, forgive us of our sins, and, and thank you again for this wonderful uh, uh, message you sent to us on uh, tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, do we have any visitors? I see the ten cities. Uh, Al, that's not your name, but that's how we know you. So, <laughs> uh, we, we thank you for uh, y'all being here tonight. Uh, and of course, the chat family, the director, all able to make it. Any other, uh, any other visitors? Any other visitors? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to ask Brother uh, Alex Smith to prepare, uh, basically, for us to be able to dismiss us. And if there's nothing else, I'll just be standing with the person. I keep on falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, I love between my Lord and I keep falling in love with him over and 
life, the Word of God. So thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, dear God. We thank you for the love, Father God, in which you have delivered us from, Father God, the consequences of sin. We thank you for that, Lord God. Let us always remember the grace by which we live and move and have our being, dear God, because of your love for us. Tonight, we want to thank you, Lord God, for Chad and the message. Thank you for, Father God, blessing him and be with us, Lord God. And Father God, continue to be with him and his family, Lord God. We also are mindful for Nico, Lord God, who is bound with the ear infection, Father God. And you bless him, Lord God. Bless his parents to take care of him as well, Lord God, and may that pass. We also pray for Christina, Lord God, that um, you bless her, Lord God, and um, just keep her, Lord God. As your will, Father God, sees fit. And we just thank you, Lord, for her, Lord God. As tonight, when we leave this place, we pray that you protect and guide us until the next appointed time. In your son's name we pray.